Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Let's get down. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray I need God. Stand to your feet. Let's prepare our hearts and go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We humble ourselves before you this day and recognize fully that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and touch us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be, all that the Son paid the price for us to be, and all that you, Holy Spirit, have empowered us to be. We'll give you the praise and glory as we live our lives out before a lost and dying world as blessed people. Now, Father, we don't just ask for ourselves, no. We ask for every church in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that's preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would bless them as you would bless us this day. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, and Pentecostals, Lord. Father, that you would just touch all of our brothers and sisters, Calvary chapels and the well and the way and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia and Trinity Church. We bless, Lord, if you will, our Catholic brothers and our Adventist brothers. At no time, Lord, we stand before you and say that we think of ourselves as better than them. Oh, Lord, we don't. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field building one kingdom, not that of a man, but that of you. And God will give you the praise and glory. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. With a great big shout, we say, amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Get your Bible. Go with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. We're going to be going into the Word of God. And like I said, there's a lot of times when I love preaching certain messages. They're just fun. This is not one of those times. But it's so real. And such a great move of the Spirit of the Lord. I want you to bear with me during the whole thing. This is not a laughing message by any means. So I'm going to tell you a joke to start off. Because quite frankly, this is the only time you're ever going to laugh the rest of the day. Are you okay for a little joke? No. Are you okay for a little joke? There's nothing wrong with having a little laughter in our lives. It doesn't have to always be so serious. The seriousness comes in just a few minutes. Man is going into a parking lot. He can't find a parking place. He's late for a meeting. He's incredibly frustrated. He lifts his head back to God and he says, God, if you'll get me a parking place, I'll go to church every Sunday. And just as his head was coming down, his eyes fixed on the car right in front of him, what was backing out. He saw the car backing out. He put the head back up immediately and said, God, forget it. I found it myself. (laughs) Isn't that like all of us, really? Kind of a bottom line, you know. We make a lot of commitments to God. We don't keep them. And oh my goodness, it's kind of a sad thing. Today, as we look at the word of the Lord, as I said, get ready for an adventure in life. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, you know, when you go line upon line, precept upon precept, you've got to preach it all. You don't have to just go to the messages that are your favorite every now and then. You actually have to preach it all. And these are one of these verses, a series of verses that really jump out as amazing verses. But they're really verses that will challenge who you are and where you're at. And sometimes when you are exposed by the Holy Spirit, it's an embarrassing situation. Embarrassing, I mean like this. I'm humiliated when someone tells me something that corrects me. I don't like, neither do you, being corrected. I don't like you know, any kind of public display of my error or of my problem. I'd much rather just kind of like coast along and not be bothered at all. 
But oftentimes we live in this embarrassing world because our sins are exposed. We know them, but yet don't do very much about them. The title of the message, if you're making notes, is Living Up to the Embarrassing Truth, found in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I want to start off and remind you about last few weeks we've been doing a little series. And the series was a wonderful series on why church. The why church is simply because it's the plan, it's the will, it is the very idea of God. Yet a lot of people don't see it that way. It's where the church is edified to grow and church is built up to have confidence to believe God beyond their own ability. It's where the gathering of the people come together and we are washed and refreshed and where we're developed and we face life that are difficult from Saturday through Sunday and then we're able to do that because of what we received a couple of times during the week, the word of God that encouraged us. It's church, but a lot of people don't see it that way. In fact, in Hebrews, if you will, the 10th chapter, verse number 25, it says these words, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. We shouldn't do that. It's the plan of God. It's the will of God. The next few verses are very interesting. The next few verses say these words, as is the manner of some. There are some people that won't do the idea of God, but only their own idea. There's some people that won't do the will of God. They'll do what they think the will of God is. There's some people that won't do the plan of God. They will only do their plan. And maybe that's you, maybe it's not you, but let's find out before the day is over with. In fact, let me just explain something to you, if I may. There's two types of people in the Bible that are equated with animals, if you will. It's kind of interesting in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. First, we all understand and know that God says that his people are sheep. If you ever understand the sheepology, if you will, of understanding they're very gentle kind, they have no uh, defense, they have no offense whatsoever, there's no offensive weapons, no defensive weapons whatsoever with sheep, they just go along and supposedly follow the shepherd. They're kind of kind, they're kind of easy to get along with, they're kind of easy to manipulate, they're really great followers, and they're called sheep. My, my Debbie, when she was a little girl, had a little sheep called Pumpkin that she raised in her back, backyard. She loved Pumpkin until her dad came in one day and put Pumpkin on a table. <laughs> Broke Deborah's heart. If I can, I just want to show you the other type of animal that's equated with people are goats. Goats are people that are very different. Goats are very different from sheep because instead of them being gentle, they will butt everything. They have little horns and they have defensive weapons and offensive weapons. They'll butt this and butt that and butt this and butt that and come up against this. In fact, you could take a sheep and put him in your backyard. He'll eat your grass and probably eat some of your flowers, but won't destroy your yard. But the difference is if you take one goat or even two and put them in your backyard, it will destroy your entire yard. A little sucker will eat every flower, everything that's green, the trees, and then start on the fence. If you throw an old tin can out there, he'll eat the tin can while he's at it. There's something about a goat. A goat uproots everything, destroys everything, has its own way of doing things. But the funny thing about goats is goats will graze with sheep. And oftentimes we find that in church, especially in American church, we'll find the goats are grazing with the sheep. Jesus called the tares of wheat. The real and the ones that are not so real. And because you graze with a sheep doesn't make you a sheep. Because the sheep has its own idea, will destroy everything around it, has its own way of doing things, has its own frustration. When we look at this verse, and it says, in the manner of some, in other words, there's some people, their idea is more important. They're thinking on how it ought to be. They can't tell you how many letters I get after 35 years of pastoring, uh, how many letters I get from people I don't even know, don't have any idea who they are, telling us how to do church. They want their way of doing church or they won't come. Let me tell you something, we don't even have our way of doing church. Hopefully we've got his way of doing church. 
And we're not going to change it for just somebody who emails me some sarcastic little words. And so he makes this statement. There's a lot of people. We don't want to be sheep. I mean, we want to be sheep. We don't want to be goats in our lives doing our own thing. With that in mind, we go to verse number 26. And before I put up verse 26, I want to share with you. He's talking about the church, talking about gathering together. He's talking about as the day is approaching when Jesus in the eastern sky is going to come. And we're all going to split out of this place and be gone because he's going to call us out of here. And thank God for that. All of a sudden, here right after verse 25 comes verse number 26. And it seems like the entire subject changes. My question to you is, does it really? Verse 26 comes along and makes this statement in verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Oh my goodness, where did that come from? You were just telling me to go to church, not to forsake the assembly, to encourage each other. Don't be like those other people that are goats. Let's be sheep and let's follow. And then all of a sudden, boom, next verse, something takes place. When you see a transition like that, you've got to stop if you have any brains at all and try to figure out what in the world's being said here because this is very important. It takes place. And sometimes we just don't think about them at all. We just move on. And yet he's making a statement. Notice the statement that he starts to make. Biggest little word in the Bible is if. Word means it's your deal. You, it's up to you. It's not about what God says. It's not about what God does. It's not about what God wills. Now it's come back onto your plate. It's your decision. It's your process. This is now you. If. It's not about what God wants you to do. It's about what you do. And then he comes along and he makes a statement. Here's an amazing two letters. Notice the words if. We. Notice how he didn't say if you. He says the words if we. Now you have to stop and think about when I talk about we, I'm talking about we, you, and me. That means who's he writing to? He's writing to the church. He's writing to Hebrew believers. He's writing to Hebrew believers that are stuck in tradition, wanting to get them out of the traditions of the Hebrew faith and the, of Jewish faith, and wants to get them over to realize that Jesus Christ is the preeminent one above everything else. He's actually talking about people who are born of the Spirit of God, and he's talking to them, and he's writing to them. Some people have a hard time with that. They think that the New Testament was written to those that are non-believers. Can I make a statement to you? Non-believers don't read the Bible. <laughs> and this was written, and notice what he says. We actually lumps himself. Whoever the writer of Hebrews is is making the statement not only about the people that are believers, he's making a statement about himself. I happen to believe it's Paul the Apostle, but no one knows that for sure. And he says, if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth. In other words, can I just make a statement? All of us have sinned after we've gotten saved. We've all screwed up. We've all made mistakes. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. In fact, if you go into 1 John and realize that if you're born of the Spirit, the Bible says you do not sin, come on. Then I must have been a horrible person because I was born of the Spirit and I kept on sinning. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But there was something on the inside of me that wouldn't let me keep on. I had to make the change. And here's what it really means. It means anybody that has sinned and keeps on sinning as if the sin is of no importance is not born of the Spirit of God. In other words, he's not just saying don't sin. He's saying you're going to sin, but you can't keep at it. Have you ever sinned and screwed up and all of a sudden on the inside of you, you go, oh my, I hate that, I hate this, I hate this. When you stop hating it and just let sin go, man, you have made a statement. You have now become a goat instead of a sheep. So he makes a statement, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there are no longer, any, and what he's making a statement of saying is, there's no more Jesus. There's not another Jesus coming next week. There's no more sacrifice of the Son of God. There's no more blood. There's no more atonement going to take place for somebody else. So once you've found out who Jesus is, receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, and then turn away and keep on doing something that's contrary to the ways of God, where else are you going to go to get saved? That's what he just said in this verse. Which brings us to verse number 27, which is real fascinating. Verse number 27, 
but a certain, in other words, I, 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 there's no place to get saved, so therefore there's a certainty gonna happen. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment. The only thing you have left after you've sinned and keep on sinning, keep on acting the way that you act, you listen to this, is an expectation of judgment. Listen, and then he describes it, a fiery indignation that will devour the adversaries. Oh my God. This is a New Testament. Oh my goodness sakes alive. In other words, you wanna keep messing with God, doing things your way, hanging out with the sheep, but you're really a goat. May I say this to you, there is a judgment waiting, and listen to what it says, a expectation of a fiery indignation, which will devour, devour, devour. Oh, I don't wanna be devoured, do you? Let's go on to verse number 28. Verse 28 makes an amazing statement, anyone, didn't just say someone, didn't say anybody, says anyone. That means somebody who's in church, somebody who's not in church, anyone. He comes along and says anyone who is. Now, this is kind of a contrasting verse. He's trying to make an example of something to show you that in the Old Testament under Moses' law, when they screwed up, man, they got it. And then if they screwed up under Moses' law in the Old Testament, how much if we screw up under the blood do we really get it here? So he makes this contrasting statement. Anyone who rejects Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Wow. That's an interesting statement. And someone might come along and say, can I just say something to you, Pastor, right there? Stop. That's the Old Testament. Things are changed now. Can I tell you something? Yep, dispensation, time period. Relationship with God has changed, but here's what has never changed. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God. He's always the same thing. And how we approach God has changed. And the ability that we have of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us has changed. That is our helper that lives on the inside of us has changed. But God never changes. Are you following me? So what God said in the Old Testament, he'll cover in the New Testament, but he'll say it a little bit different, but it's the same heartbeat for things in the Old Testament. So what took place at times of Moses, my goodness, if that took place at just out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, somebody died and God accepted that? Wow, you gotta be kidding me, but watch this. Next verse, verse number 29. And how much worse punishment? Now I'm talking about different subjects. My friends, listen to the word punishment. We go to American churches all the time and in American churches it's love this and God loves you. God really loves you and he died for you and died for the sinner and cares about you. God's mercy is new every day and God loves you. And that is absolutely 100% the truth. But you also know and you gotta know that God's not a God you can mess with. Never could in the Old Testament, you can't now in the New Testament. How much worse is the punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who had trampled the son of God underfoot? I'm gonna come back to that, but I want you to see this word, thought worthy. Who thought him worthy? I mean, did God think of him as worthy? Oh, wait a minute. Did the guy that trampled the son of God under his feet, did he think of himself as worthy? Question, third question. Was he worthy? Well, let's go on in the verse and see. He makes this statement, part B, if you will, please. Counting the blood of the covenant by which he was, by which he was, Oh my goodness. You don't get sanctified because you go to church. Sanctified means that something's washed you clean and now has separated you onto the Lord. You don't get separated onto the Lord by just being, you know, somebody who has mental ascension towards God. And all of a sudden, here's this guy. And notice the little H's here. They're not capital H's, not talking about God, talking about a person. And he says this, he's counted the blood of the covenant, the blood of the covenant as, listen to this, as that sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. 
Oh my goodness. Wait a minute, can I ask you a question? Insulted the spirit of grace? So here's this guy that has the spirit. Let's back up, watch this. Has the spirit, has been set aside, sanctified, and thought to be worthy. Could that be us at times in our life? Could that be you? Could that be me? Oh my goodness. Now let's back up to part number A. Let me explain what these means. There's three things this guy does that separates him from God. Makes him a goat instead of a sheep. Are you following me? Are you following me? Three things that he does in verse number, if you will, in verse number 29, that he does that makes him a goat instead of the sheep. He may graze with the sheep, but God knows the difference. Now watch this. The first thing is how much more is a punishment is supposed to those who thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God under feet. Do you know what the Son of God under feet means? Wait a minute. Stop thinking about it for a while. The bottom of your life, the physical life, are your feet. When I take something in my life and put it under my feet, it is now beneath me. And what I'm saying by doing that is less importance is he, God, because he's under my feet than me that's up above. In other words, God becomes less important than my own feelings, my own life, my own wants, my own will, my own ways, my own desires, my own plan. Which takes us right back, if you will, to not forsaking the assembly to be like some. So all of a sudden, I'm taking God. My plan is more important. My will is more important. My desire is more important. My direction is more important. Who I am is more important. Oh yes, I still know who God is, but I've taken God, and I haven't taken him out of my life. I've just put him under my own feet because I'm more important. And now all of a sudden, you went from a sheep to a goat. Part B, counted the blood of the covenant by which he, by which he was, by which he was, past tense, by which he was sanctified a common thing. A common thing is this, just something. The very blood that healed you, the very blood that sprinkled on the atonement seat on the heavens, the very blood that paid the price for you to be free, the very blood that brought you into the family of God, the very blood that makes you a brother and sister and join heir and heir with Jesus Christ, that very blood that took you out of the sins and out of the pit of hell and brings you into the kingdom of God, that blood that washes away all of your sins is now treated like your car. Are your kids Sunday soccer game becomes more important and more alive is the blood is just a common very important but along with everything else that's important it's right there it's common and I've said it a million times in this church what you treat as common will become common you take God you treat God like he's common you go from a sheep to a goat and God knows it becomes common. But then the verse goes on and says this word, and insulted the spirit of grace. Third thing he does. Insults the spirit of grace means this, that you ignore the working of the Holy Spirit in your life and do not depend on the Holy Spirit to exist. Wait a minute. If the President of the United States came into your house, you would roll out the red carpet. You'd cook the best meal you know how to. You would be a nervous wreck. You would him haw. You would go, oh my goodness, you're here. I can't believe this. Can I do a selfie with you? Oh my goodness, Lord. I, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. President, this is amazing. <laughs> you know it. But if the president walked into your house and you ignored him, that means you ignore his position, his power, 
his authority, his statue. You ignore him. And that's what he's talking about. So that you ignore the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You put him under your own thing, under your feet, because you're more important. You make decisions based on your feelings instead of what he says. You come along, you treat him as common, just something good in your life, along with every other good thing. Thirdly, you take the Holy Spirit and you ignore him. And that's unbelievable. Now you've become a goat. From verse 29, something takes place. Do you know what it is? Verse 30. And here's the breakdown of this truth. The heart ache I have as a pastor for some of you that are in here. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. Stop there, look back up at me. We always thought vengeance is going to get the bad guy. It's what we thought. It's what we've been taught. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge. Oh, and here was the greatest shock. Not the bad guys, not the people who hate God, not the people who are out there. The Bible makes it very clear, he will judge his people. His people. Judgment, the Bible says, starts in the house of God. What the heck does that mean? That means God's going to find out whether we're sheep by our actions and our lifestyle or whether we are goats. And somebody that needs to love you will put you in this embarrassing position because they love you and don't want you to end up a goat because here's what happens, verse 31. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Fearful thing. What good would a pastor be if he didn't care about his people to tell him the truth? I know some of you will leave. I know some of you will get in your car and call me names. But you someday will stand and your knee will bow before God and God will tell you that he sent somebody to tell you the truth that loved you. And you wouldn't listen. Don't clap. Don't clap. I, I don't, I'm not looking for applause. God's trying to make a statement. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. What kind of punishment are we talking about? What is this fearful hands of God that we're talking about? Let's just quickly look at the Old Testament for a moment. Hebrew, excuse me, let's take a look at Psalms, if you will. Pop it up, 11th chapter, verse 5. The Lord will test the righteous, but the wicked... And the one who loves violence, that means contra ways contrary to his, doing their own ways. Anything that's contrary to his is described evil. Don't care if you call it good. Can I just say something to you? You can be godly and not be spiritual. Did you just hear what I just said? You can be godly, not spiritual. Because not all your concept, my concept of what's God is truly God's concept, making it unspiritual. And it's a spirit, wrong spirit. Is anybody listening? Verse five, six, just pop it up real quick. Upon the wicked he will rain coals of fire and brimstone and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. <sighs> That's so shocking. Just horrible. Malachi, if you will, the fourth chapter, verse 1, says it like this. Behold, in the day of his coming, don't you know he's coming? That's the day we're all to gather together. That's why we need church. That's why we're here. That's why we're not running from this. We're running to it. He says, burning like an oven. All the proud. See the word proud up there? You know what the word proud means? Self-centered and directed. Not God-centered and directed. Self-centered and directed. Shall the proud, yes, all those who do wickedly will be, what's that word? Can you imagine when fire hits stubble? Just pops. 
the day which is coming shall burn them up. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. That's all great, but that's all Old Testament stuff. Oh, I understand you. Yes, you're right. It is. And we could go to 40 more verses. But what about in the New Testament? Have you ever read the words of Jesus? Jesus makes this statement. John, the seventh chapter, verse 21. I just had them. I didn't say this in the last one. I kind of alluded to it, but I didn't say it. But I'm going to have them pop that up. John 7, 21. Do you have that? It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute. You've got to be kidding me. But he who does, he who does, he who does, he who does. In other words, my love got to go past my lips into my action of what I, I can't just tell Debbie I love her and then run out on her. I got to say, Lord, I, I, Debbie, I love you. And I'm not running out on you. I'm here for you. My actions back what my lips say. Is anybody listening? But he who does the will of the Father in heaven. Go with me, if you will, real quick. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Just pop it up. Verse number 9. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cast it from you. He's not telling you to pluck out your eye. He's telling you to make changes in your life. For it's better for you to enter into life, thank God for life, with one eye than rather with two and be cast where? Into hell fire. Don't tell me God isn't saying the same thing he said in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Now watch this. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, it's kind of a fascinating verses. Listen to, my, listen to me, people. Don't let your minds wander now. It's too good for you. Matthew, 25th chapter. We put it up the last 10 years. It's been the mantra of so many churches in the world. The first bunch of verses, you know, this is where Jesus comes along and he makes this statement in the 25th chapter. When the time comes, he's going to separate the goats and the sheep. Could you just pop up, what is it, verse 32? All the nations will gather before him and he will separate one from another as a shepherd divides as a shepherd divides, as a shepherd divides, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Listen to the words. He will set his sheep. So we understand what he's doing here. New Testament. If you look at your Bible, this is red letter. This is Jesus talking. This is not me talking. This is not somebody writing. This is Jesus talking. And in verse number 34, let's take a look at it. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Those are the sheep on his right hand. Remember that? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You want to be on his right hand. More than anything, you are not in this building today to play church. You are here in this building to become the church. You are here in this building to find out the truth. What is it that God really wants from me? And you do not want to be on his left hand. You want to be on his right hand. And he says these words. He says, my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me. And now he's not talking about good works. He's talking about living a godly lifestyle. Let me say it again. He's not talking about going out and doing good works. He's talking about, and not that that's not important. It is important. He's talking about having a godly lifestyle. Now watch this in verse number 30. I was naked and you clothed me and I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse 37. And the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you and, as a stranger and take you in and, and naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will say 
to them, assuredly I'll say unto you, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. We know the verse. We've heard these verses. They're on the walls of our church, and they are important. But the verses after it shocked me as a pastor. And I want to take you, if I may, because the first word in verse 30, 41 is this. Then Jesus, then he will also say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, unto the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food and I was thirsty and you gave me no drink, 43. And I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick in prison and you didn't visit me. But here's the shocker. Are you ready? This is the one that broke my heart. I don't know if I could even get through it now. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, they answered him saying, Lord, they answered him saying, Lord, they thought they were okay with God. They knew him as Lord. They knew him as the Savior. They knew him as the Son of God. They knew him as a crucified one. And they will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or a stranger and naked and sick in prison and did not minister to you? And he says, then he will answer them, saying, as surely I say unto you, inasmuch as you did not do it unto the least of these, you did not do it unto me. But verse 46 was a shocker. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Now, wait a minute. Jesus makes a statement. He says, there's a day coming when people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. And he says, not everybody that calls me Lord will enter into the kingdom of God. That's the shock. The foolishness of us preachers that say, if you know who Jesus is, you're all right with God. The devil knows who Jesus is, and he's certainly not all right with God. And you haven't had knowledge, are grazing with the sheep once in a while doesn't make you right with God. But he that does the kingdom of God. So they come to Jesus. They say, Lord, Lord. He looks at them and says, go for me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. They stop and they're shocked. And they say, Lord, what do you mean you don't know it? Why, Lord, we've cast out many demons in your name. We've prophesied in your name. We've done many works, good works in your name. Wait a minute, whose name? You'd have to know something about God to prophesy in his name. You'd have to have some kind of a relationship with God to cast out demons in his name. You'd have to have some understanding of who God was to do mighty works. He looks at them again and he doesn't say, oh, well, forgive me, I've made a mistake. He says, go for me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not even though they did those things in his name, and they called him Lord. Why? Because unless you do the will of the Father, not yours, you become a goat. And if you become a goat, instead of a sheep, the day will come when you're separated, and you'll not make it. That's the sad part of this whole thing. I'll tell you a story, and I'll conclude with this. A lady by the name of Jan Davis, she was 60 years old, a professional parachuter. She was very much involved in something called base jumping. Free base jumping is an interesting thing. 
It's where they take their parachutes, they climb up on the top of a building, you've seen it, and they jump off a building or a rock or a mountain cliff of some kind. They fall, they open up their chutes, and the last minute was quite a crazy extreme sport. She and four of her colleagues, five men, four men and herself, went, if you will, in October 22nd, 1999, to El Capitan, if you will, in Yosemite National Park. The first one jumped off in front of an audience and in front of the news media. Her husband was recording all of this. The second one jumped off. The third one jumped off. She was the fourth. And when she pulled her chute open, which she had done hundreds of times, the chute did not open, and the fall off of a 3,200-foot-high granite rock of El Capitan took 20 seconds for her to hit the bottom and splatter all over everybody. To the shock of every person there. I tell you the story because you need to know the truth about the story. She and her four colleagues were protesting the law. The law said that you cannot any longer base jump from any place in Yosemite Park because they had already had six deaths and many injuries before. She was demonstrating before the news media how safe the sport is that day by breaking the law, she was illegal. She knew better and did what she wanted to do. In a sense, she's like a goat when she should have been someone following the rules, a sheep. And she died. The question today is, where are you? What are you falling from? When you know that there's rules out there and you know there's a way out there, it's his way. His plan, his idea for your life, do we trample him under our feet? Do we treat him as common? Do we mingle with the sheep and call ourselves sheep when we're really goats? Because they didn't separate themselves God had to come and separate them. Today, this place is filled with goats. As much as I love you, as much irritating as that is to you, possibly even embarrassing, humiliating, some of you have been mistreating God. You've treated him as common. You mistreat the people around you, your loved ones, husband, wives. You haven't been godly in your lifestyle. You go to church once in a while. In fact, you even hate going to church because in church you find yourself feeling like you don't even really belong. You're headed to become a goat unless you make some changes. Today, in this safe, godly place, you can make the change today once and for all. From being that goat to making yourself a sheep by giving God all of your heart and all of your life and staying with the commitment. So many times Christians are tricked into believing that's all you have to do is pray. Can I tell you something? Praying opens the door, but you gotta keep going through the door in order to make your prayers valid. Because it's he that does the will of the Father that gets to go to heaven, not just somebody who knows the Father. Today there's no doubt you know who he is. But today, you need to get out of your seat, get your stuff, and you need to come and give God once and for all. I'm talking about once and for all. I don't care if you prayed Billy Graham, I don't care if you prayed a Harvest Crusade, I don't care where you're at. Those prayers are great, 
but did you follow up with all of your heart and all of your life? Because that's what we're talking about as a commitment. Someone said it's about relationship with God. Can I tell you something? It's not about relationship with God. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because you can have any kind of a relationship with God. You can have a shallow relationship, a junky relationship, a cheap relationship. We're talking about if you want relationship, it's a deep, wholehearted, committed relationship with God. And that's what God wants from you and from me. And those of you that haven't had it yet and need to have it, or have you even prayed that prayer, you need to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. You need to get out of your seat. And I will pray with you. We'll pray with you right here at the Rock Church and World Outreach. Center. But today is your day of salvation. And you can sit back and be mad at the deliverer of this message today. But God has spoken to you about your relationship with God. And if somebody doesn't tell you the truth, you're going to end up in those places that you don't want to be in. And I'm telling you today, get your stuff, get your clothes, get your purse, get your sweater, get your stuff. Stand up right now and get down here. You come now, come. Right now, come. Those of you that need to come, you get out of your seat and come home now before it's too late. Come on, don't clap. Just get up and come. Nobody's asking you to clap. You know it's you. You know you need to get out of your seat. You know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you've been walking compromised. Don't look to your neighbor and wait for them to move. This is your life. You'll stand before God without your neighbor being there. Get out of your seat and come. Today, the man of God is crying out for you, fighting a good fight of faith for you. Come now, get out of your seat and come. Come from the family room, bring your children. Come from the family room, bring your children. They're full and packed. Come from the foyer, come now. It's time, it's time to get out of yourself and get into him. They're still coming, come on home. Come on home, hurry, hurry, hurry. Don't let anything stop you. Who cares what people think? Yeah, it's embarrassing. Yeah, it's humiliating. Who gives a flip? When the day comes and the eastern sky splits, you'll not be separated away from Jesus. You'll be embraced by him, and that's what this is all about. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you to come. Today is your day of salvation. We're not going to play church. I'm not sprinkling you with water. I'm not blowing incense all over you. I'm not hyping you for your money. I'm telling you the truth. This is not about milk and money. This is about milk and honey waiting for you. God wants to do a great thing. Get out of your seat and come. I still feel you need to come. I still feel you're battling on the inside. If you're battling on the inside and you're wondering if it's you, boy, let me tell you something. It is you. Yep, you just come. They're still coming. Somebody needed to love you enough to tell you the truth. Oh my goodness, can you imagine the shock of the American church? God forgive us. God forgive us preachers, we're so stupid at times. Anybody else? Anybody else? This is Pastor Joel. Joel's waving at all of you. Look over here to your left. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you. He's going to give you some free stuff. He's going to tell you about a program we have to help you get strong in Jesus. So You know why? So you don't go back doing the same old junk you used to do. We'll help you keep going forward. That's what this is all about. This is not about coming one day and and, 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 and say, oh yes, I want Jesus, then go back, become a goat. That doesn't work. Well, let us help you. That's what this church is all about. That's why there's 20,000 people in church. 
because we're here helping people get right with God, strong with God. So today is your day of salvation. It'll only take a few minutes. People you came with, I want you to make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. We do that. Come on, everybody. Give the Lord a great big praise. Don't go back to your seat. Just come on. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.